Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me clearly? Is the sound system working well? Thank you very much. Lovely to see you all here. We are joined uh, also by people who are watching on the BAA YouTube channel <coughs> live uh, through the excellent technical services being provided here by the IOP technical staff. Welcome uh, to, this is the fourth meeting of the 132nd year of the BAA. And I'd like to extend a welcome to any new members. If there are any new members attending, is there anybody who's attending the meeting for the first time? One new member. Can you tell me your name, sir? Yes, Michael. Michael. Uh, welcome, Michael, uh, from me as president. I hope you will have a very long and happy association with us. And uh, do uh, write to me if you have got any questions or anything you'd like to know. Thank you very much. Something else I don't know. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've been a member for 22 years, but this is my first. Oh, actual... well, glad you could make it. What's your name? Prince Albert Chester. 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 Prince publication in the journal at today's council meeting. I will ask Jeremy Shears, the paper secretary, to uh, briefly appraise you of what they are. Thank you, David. There were four papers uh, accepted at council today, and uh, it, it's noteworthy that uh, all four of them are reports of our observing section, so that's uh, very nice to see. Um, I'll read them out. The, uh, the Brighter Comets of 2020 by Jonathan Shanklin. The 2021 to 2022 Eastern Elongation of Venus by Paul Abel. And uh, Noctilucent Cloud over Britain and Western Europe in 2021 by Ken Kennedy. And the fourth one is Six Remarkable Northerly Novi in 2020 to 2021 by uh, somebody called Jeremy Shears. So it's a report of the Variable Star section. Thank you. A, a, a prolific author and papers as well as... Our papers secretary, who is responsible for vetting them and uh, making sure we have informative and sensible papers. <clears throat> it's not easy to get a paper in, you know. It has to be read by two experts in the field and uh, approved, commented on. So it's it's a rigorous procedure, uh, but as a result. Uh, they, they, they are reproduced and cited uh, in scientific uh, websites all over the world. Forthcoming events, uh, you're all reminded of the BAA Winchester weekend, which is coming up shortly on 8th of April. Are bookings still open for that? Do, does anybody know? Are, there, are bookings still open for, for Winchester? No. Are bookings still open or not for Winchester? No, still open, but I still have places. Right. Right, so that, that's Anne Davies, the organiser, who says if you haven't booked and really, really want to come, it's still within the realms of possibility. So, uh, and that's, that's a two-day event, uh, 8th to 9th of April. Uh, the next meeting after that will be in Leeds. We are having our <coughs> spring meeting, 23rd of April, at the School of Music, University of Leeds. We've also, we've got a webinar in May from the historical section, 14th of May, and uh, we're having a talk from uh, Dr. Wayne Augustin. Uh, I'm not quite sure what it's about. It's on sub some... Yeah, some historical thing. <laughs> and uh, the next meeting we will have here, the Institute of Physics, and also online, uh, will be 25th of May, uh, which will be a special general meeting to approve the subscription rate for the next year. And also we will have talks, including the George Alcock Memorial Lecture, 
which will be given by Mike Fawkes on that occasion and will be about Stormers on Saturn. So that's what's coming up. Uh, today we have three speakers for you, uh, all of whom have been associated with the BAA for a long time. We have Dr. Jacqueline Mitton, we have Martin Lewis, and we have Callum Potter. And first of all, uh, Dr. Ja Jacqueline Mitton. Uh, she's been a BAA member since 1966, and she was editor of the journal and also of the handbook at different times. And she's also worked for the Royal Astronomical Society as press officer. She's co-author, uh, usually with her husband, Simon, of over 30 books on astronomy. Uh, and she's had a long-standing interest in the history of women in astronomy. Her latest book is a biography of the astronomer Vera Rubin, which was published in 2021. So uh, she tells me she hasn't been to any BAA meetings for a long time, so she doesn't know a lot of you. A lot of you have joined since she was uh, on the council of the BAA, so um, she'd be very pleased to meet you. And uh, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Mitton, who's going to talk about Maria Mitchell, the Danish Comet Medal and early American astronomy. Thank you. Well, first of, first of all, I'd just like to say a, a, a personal note, and that is how delighted I am to be here in person. I, <clears throat> I just couldn't resist the temptation when I was invited to come to, uh, to be at a BAA meeting uh, in person again. And although I haven't been involved actively in coming to meetings for quite some time, I'd just like to say how close the BAA has remained um, to, to my heart, having joined when I was you know, at the tender age of 18 and when I was computing comet orbits and got, getting involved with the computing section and done all sorts of things since then and so I always look forward to the to the journal with great interest and um, you know as uh, as us oldies often do I I've now moved over a little bit to doing the, the history so <laughs> that's where that's where we we are today so um <clears throat> the fun finding out about um, women astronomers uh, of the past has been a particular interest of mine um, I think ever since I was a graduate student back in the, the 1970s, I remember being invited to give a talk at Newnham College. Um, I'm not quite sure why they invited me, uh, except possibly it was because I was only the second woman ever to be accepted to do a PhD at the observatories in Cambridge, which may sound quite surprising, but it was true. Um, and... Uh, they approached me and said, could you give us a talk about women astronomers? Um, I knew nothing about it, but it, of course I set to to find out. Uh, and that was really, for me, at the start of a very long journey, um, which um, has brought me through 50, 50 years of finding out more and more. And as you just heard most recently, um, writing a biography of, of Vera Rubin. Well... Even 50 years ago, um, uh, Mariah Mitchell, um, uh, her story, what was really quite well known, uh, she was the first American astronomer, female astronomer, uh, and um, <clears throat> she was born on the island of, of Nantucket. Um, she shot to fame in 19... I say 19, 1849, when she was just 32 years old, um, after she'd received a gold medal from the King of Denmark for the discovery of a comet uh, that she'd made two years earlier. Later in life, she was appointed the first um, professor of astronomy at Vassar College, a college for women, when it was first opened. And you can see here rather formidable looking older Mariah um, in front of her telescopes and her, her students. So even in the 
<clears throat> I've learned a great deal more about Mariah uh, since I gave that very first talk back in the, uh, the, the 1970s. Um, and, um, the, but even since then, however much I've read about her, there's a little bit about her story and the discovery of the medal, the, the comet and the award of the medal, that's, that's continued to intrigue me. Um, because even early in the 19th century, the discovery of comets was not that rare. And after all, Caroline Herschel had discovered quite a few, um, and uh, eight comets indeed between 1786 and 1797. So what was all this about? Why did the king of a faraway country, a small European country, the other side of the Atlantic, award Mitchell a medal and why was it such a big deal? So um, a few years ago, I finally got around to looking for the answers. Now, some of the things I found out at that time became the basis for a paper, uh, which was in the BAA journal, I think, the reason why I got invited to talk today. Um, but I've carried on looking for some of those answers, and I'm still puzzling over some aspects of it. But the basis of that the paper and a few more things that I've been looking into since is what I'm going to talk about today. And you can see a summary of that, of that here. A little bit about comet hunting in the early 19th century. A bit more about the King of Denmark's medal competition. Um, Mariah's Comet and her connection with Harvard College, which is a very important part of the story. How Mariah's medal was actually secured for her. And then a few... Uh, concluding remarks. Well, in, we're, we're in the 1840s uh, when Mariah discovered her, her comet, and from the start of the 19th century, there have been a really big interest in comets that intensified among the public as well as among astronomers. And around the 1840s, you've got Sir John Herschel writing that comet discoveries though few in number, are full of interest. And there is no branch of astronomy more replete with interest. And they may eventually have an important bearing on our knowledge of the laws and constitution of the universe. So that is a reflection of how people really uh, regarded comets at that time. Um, in such was the fascination with comets that valuable prizes went to some of those who discovered them and plotted their orbits. One of the first of those prizes to be instituted was um, the French Academy of Sciences establishing the Lalande Prize in 1802. It was endowed by Jerome Lalande, who'd worked on planetary theory, and he'd helped to predict the return of Halley's Comet in 1759. Um, Awards were made mostly annually, with a few years off, uh, but often the award was split between several people as well. Um, and although it was for furthering the progress of astronomy generally, in practice, during those first few decades of the award, it was given numerous times to people who found comets or worked on their orbits. Now here we've got some of the comet discoverers who won the Lalande Prize. Uh, particularly, I chose the date between 1818 and 1847 because that was between the year of Mariah Mitchell's birth and when she discovered her comet. And if, if any of you are sort of into comets and, uh, and some of those names that might seem familiar to you, the people whose comets um, particularly have been uh, periodic comets and come back and you, you know those names, like Pons and Divico, and of course some of those astronomers are famous in their, their own um, right for, for, for other reasons. <coughs> Jean-Louis Pons discovered a total of 37 comets and received the Lalande Prize three times. Jean-Félix Gambard, who discovered 13 comets, received it four times. Well then, uh, in 1831, the Danish king established a medal especially for comets. And um, anyone who satisfied a rather 
stringent set of conditions that was in the rules was entitled to one of these valuable gold medals. <clears throat> King Frederick VI of Denmark reigned between 1808 and 1839. He had a great interest in science and particularly in astronomy. He, he, now he was persuaded to institute the medals in 1831 by the German-speaking Danish astronomer Heinrich Christian Schumacher, who'd already tapped into the generous king's patronage. The king had paid for Schumacher to have a brand new observatory at Altona near Hamburg. It was completed in 1832 and it set Schumacher up with a comfortable position for life. <clears throat> Now, should explain a bit of geography here. Um, although Hamburg and Altona are now in Germany, at that time, Denmark had sovereignty over the disputed regions of um, Schleswig-Holstein, where Hamburg and Altona are. I hope you can see on, on the map here. Um, <clears throat> Denmark was rather a larger country then than it, than it is now. <coughs> Now, the king had also paid from his personal budget for Schumacher to set up a new astronomical journal in 1821. It's called the Astronomische Nachrichten, which translates as Astronomical Notes. Now, for some time, German and Danish astronomers had been very keen to have a reliable journal for disseminating their discoveries and their observations very quickly. And Schumacher, especially with his royal patronage and permanent base, had been the ideal person to take it on. You can see here the title page of the very first issue of AN, where Schumacher set out what the journal was, was for. And he refers to his higher support, that's the king, and how he's now in a position to offer this rapid publication, uh, relatively rapid as it was in those days. AN very quickly became the journal of international record for comet observations and discoveries, um, among other astronomical use, news. Although um, such uh, discoveries also appeared in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society and elsewhere. The King was very happy to build on the prestige that AN had brought to Denmark and so he took up Schumacher's idea of the medals, um, of Denmark having its own competition, and with Schumacher in charge of it, of course. Um, he was quite an operator, was Schumacher. It fitted very well with AN's purpose, and it gave astronomers an incentive to send their comet observations promptly to Schumacher and his, his journal. Now, the competition, the rules, were announced in 1832, but they were modified shortly afterwards following an agreement with the Royal Astronomical Society, which wanted to sort of muscle in on this. Um, and these um, rules, so which um, you can see here, where they were published in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, they set out some very strict conditions for notifying the comet discoveries. They had to be sent to Schumacher if the discoverer was in continental Europe or to Francis Bailey, representing the Royal Astronomical Society in London, if the discoverer was in Great Britain or, as the rules put it, in any other quarter of the globe. Bailey was one of the founders of the RAS and served four times as its president, so very eminent man. Schumacher and Bailey had to decide between them whether a claimant had satisfied the rules. With Heinrich Olbert, um, uh, the man who's um, famous for his paradox, acting as a referee if they couldn't agree. Now, key points <coughs> of the rules. The medals were awarded uh, for the discovery of a previously unknown comet that was invisible to the naked eye, first point then the discoverer had to inform either Schumacher or Bailey immediately 
Now, immediately in those days meant by the first post, and it's in italics, um, after the discovery, without waiting for a confirmatory observations. And of course, we're, we're back in the 1830s. If there was no postal service, then the notice was to be sent by the first conveyance that presented itself. So <laughs> not sure what that was going to be. But um, a later post, anyway, the point was that a later post wouldn't do. Even if no one else sent in notice of the discovery, it had to be the first post, or no medal was, was awarded at all. If someone else later found the comet independently and sent in their discovery by the first post, then they were entitled to the medal. So I don't know how they worked out what the first posts were, but they must have had their ways and means. Ideally, the report had to give the time of discovery, the position of the comet, and its direction of travel. But if the first night's observations weren't good enough uh, to get all that, the discoverer had to send in another communication as soon as they'd made a second observation. And then it says in bold type, the hope of getting a second observation will not be admitted as an excuse for delaying the communication of the first. So you can see how, um, how bossy these rules were. Judging took place 12 months after a comet had been discovered, and I guess the people who thought it might have been them who deserved the medal um, put in their claims. But when it was judged, no claims were made, uh, could be made subsequently. Now, interesting thing was that although the, the um, competition didn't run for all that long, between 1832 and 1847, just 15 years, it did result in several of the conventions that we associate with comets now becoming the norm, such as the prompt reporting of the comet discoveries to a central clearinghouse, establishing who could claim priority for the discovery, and informally identifying comets by using the name of the person who first discovered it. And that really can all be traced back to the, to the medal competition. So who were the people who actually got these medals? Now, this is where my research has uh, run a bit into the ground. I've not been able to come up with a complete list of recipients of the Danish Comet Medals. I have an idea that possibly somewhere buried in an archive in Copenhagen or somewhere, uh, there'll be a, um, in the Royal Archives, it will say who the king gave the medals to. But um, so far, I haven't managed to get to probe that far. In, in all the astronomical literature, I've turned up some incomplete and sometimes rather inconsistent uh, records. But what I think I found is that um, there were at least 18 medals run, uh, awarded during the years when the competition ran. And I suspect that there were probably more. Um, and here, here are some names of those uh, who did win it. Um, the names in yellow were also winners of the Lalande Prize. Um, we've met some of those already with their pictures. Um, and a number of individuals won more than one of the Danish medals. And we, we've got some individuals here, like um, Gamba, who were, were, were really coining them in. They got, they got all the Lalonde Prizes and all the Danish medals, which were really worth something. They were, they were solid gold. They were really quite valuable. Perhaps that explains why we don't know where they are anymore. Perhaps they, <laughs> perhaps they spent them in some sense, spent the gold. Um, Gamba was the first recipient. Um, and then um, we, we've got um, Gore, uh, Divico, the Dane, Theodore Brawson. The only British recipients were Scotsman, James Dunlop, who was the second recipient, and he was working at Parramatta in Australia at the time when he discovered a comet in 1833. But he was well connected with the, uh, the, the people in, in Denmark, so he would have known what was going on with the prize. And then John Russell Hind, um, who won one of the last medals for a discovery made at George Bishop's Observatory in London in 1847. Now, after... Francis Bailey died in 1844, his place as the RAS's referee 
for the Danish medal was taken by George Biddle Airy, the Astronomer Royal. We can tell how strictly the rules were applied from what Airy wrote in his own autobiographical notes, as Airy recorded several comments on awards that either were made or refused. So he wrote, 1846, for discovery of comets, three medals were awarded by Schumacher and me, one to Peters, two to De Vico. A comet was seen by Hind and by no other observer, but after correspondence, principally in 1848, the medal was refused to him. So, 1848. In this year, Schumacher and I refused a medal to Miss Mitchell for a comet discovered because the rules of correspondence had not been strictly followed. The King of Denmark gave one by special favour. 1849. I agreed with Schumacher in giving no medal to Mr. G.P. Bond. His comet was found to be Peterson's. Five medals were awarded for comets in 1847. Hind, Collar, Mauvais, Brawson, Schweitzer. So by the time Airy was writing up these biographical notes, he was, it was obviously sufficiently long afterwards that he was able to record that Mariah Mitchell had been awarded a medal for her 1847 discovery, but through the intervention of the king himself. Airy and Shoemaker, of course, had no authority to bend the rules. So how did it come about that the king was persuaded to make an exception? Now that story forms the next part of my talk. So we're back with Mariah a little bit about her background. I've only time today to give a brief outline of her background. I hope enough to put events into context. Now Nantucket, where she was born and brought up, is off the northeast coast of the United States near to Cape Cod. The map here shows how relatively near Nantucket is to Boston where Harvard College is, which is, of course, an important factor in this story. As Quakers, her family believed strongly in educating girls. I make that <coughs> comment because that wasn't always true at this period in history. And Mariah's father, William, was passionate about astronomy. The navigational aspects of um, astronomy were especially important because the community on Nantucket was seafaring. They, they were engaged in whaling, fishing, and very much a coastal community. And the um, observations that they made were of strictly of, of necessity. Um, so you can see how, how near we are to, um, to Boston and Harvard College. Um, and. Um, in this formal engraving, Mariah's par par parents, I have to say, have a rather severe expression. But it's clear that the family were close and mutually supportive. And there's no doubt that Mariah and her father got on tremendously well together. Now, William Mitchell, Mariah's father, set up a small observatory at, the ho at his home. He did that with the help of two uh, specialists, Elias Loomis and William Cranch Bond, who you can see here. Loomis was a professor of mathematics, and he established an observatory in 1838 at what was then the Western Reserve College in Ohio. It has a different name now. It was only the second professional observatory in the United States, the first having been founded at Williams College in 1836. So you can see how behind Europe the United States was. Bond was, um, oh, I should say, you can see Elias here with the plans of um, his own uh, um, pioneering observatory. Bond was a clockmaker and a keen amateur astronomer and um, in 1839, he'd been persuaded to move um, to some modest premises at Harvard College uh, with his own equipment for astronomy. He was an amateur, remember, um, 
and to act as the unpaid astronomical observer to the college. Uh, ultimately, in 1846, he did become the first salary director of Harvard College Observatory when it was properly founded. Bond and his son, George, and William Mitchell were very close associates. And for example, Mitchell ended up serving as on the visiting committee to the Harvard College Observatory. So as a young girl, Mariah learned from her father how to make telescopic observations. William bought a seven centimeter Dolland refractor, which you can sit here, see here in a picture I think I remember taking myself when I visited the um, Mariah's birthplace, uh, which is now forms part of the Mariah Mitchell Association's um, uh, premises and uh, is with the observatory. Wonderful place to go if you get the chance. Um, he also bought a nine centimeter um, uh, uh, yes, I think first I should also say that that, that that seven centimeter one was the one that Mariah used for her sky scraping and, and to make the point that she also taught herself um, advanced mathematics. Uh, she just studied the works of Laplace and Gauss and, um, and self-taught. So by the time she was in her early 20s, Mariah was an accomplished and dedicated observer as well as a skilled mathematician. And in addition to the seven centimeter that she was using for sky sweeping, the small observatory had a nine centimeter Dolland refractor and they got two transit instruments on loan from the US Coastal Survey for this, for the navigational work. And there's a very famous portrait that you can see here of uh, Mariah, which was painted after the discovery of the, of the comet. And she's shown there with one of the <laughs> transit instruments that was on loan from the US Coastal Survey. So in the early 1840s, there was still very little by the way of professional observatories and, and observational astronomy in the United States. It had been hard to get funding and what funding there was tended to come from wealthy donors and uh, um, public subscriptions. Now, comets are one of those things that get people excited about astronomy and particularly raise the public interest. And 1835, return of Halley's Comet, that began to raise public interest. William Mitchell was among a handful of American observers who independently re recovered Halley's Comet. And um, you can see here a, a very nice uh, watercolor. This was actually supposed to be a representation in Kent of people observing Halley's Comet but uh, shows the, the great public interest that there was in it. Well, if that had attracted public interest, the great daylight comet of 1843 created even more. Now, Bond at Harvard College was still unpaid with his amateur limited facilities, and he was unable to match the observations of this great comet that were made at Philadelphia's Central High School which had, um, with uh, some educational funds they'd been given, had bought a 13 centimeter German-made uh, refractor. For a short time, the Philadelphia High School had the largest telescope and the best telescope in the United States. Well, shocked at seeing prestigious Harvard College outdone <coughs> by a high school, the good citizens of Boston subscribed enough money to enable Bond to acquire a Mertz and Mahler 38 inch, 38 centimeter um, equatorial from Germany and to get him started being paid a salary as director of the observatory. Um, and here we can see the, uh, what came to be known as the great refractor. It was installed in 1847 um, it was then one of the largest telescopes in the world, and it remained the largest telescope in the United States for 20 years. We can also see the rather splendid building that was built for Harvard College Observatory there. Now, the other thing, uh, so they, they, 
got this wonderful telescope now, but from even before that telescope was installed, young George Bond, the son of um, William Cranch Bond, he, he was only 20 at the time, became an avid comet hunter. He was assisting his father at the, at the observatory, and they had a couple of small telescopes that had been donated for the purpose of comet hunting. Um, sadly, no picture has survived of George, who succeeded his father as director, um, but died young. And um, the Bonds started to submit their comet observations to the Astronomische Nachrichten and to the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society. So what you can see here is an example in AN of um, observations showing that George Bond had independently found what is now called 122P uh, Divico, and he found it independently five days later than Divico. I mean, no mean feat, actually, given um, uh, that uh, uh, the state of, of US astronomy at, at the time. So, in fact, at that time, Mariah Mitchell and George Bond were the only active comet hunters in the United States. And some friendly rivalry developed between them. Now, Mariah discovered her comet on the 1st of October, 1847, at 10.30 p.m., during routine sky sweeping. As a careful observer, her instinct was not to report it, which meant, in her case, not writing to the Bonds at Harvard until she was sure that the object had moved. Now, Elias Loomis, who would undoubtedly have discussed the discovery circumstances with the Mitchells, later wrote, there was scarcely a doubt of the cometary character of this object, inasmuch as the region which it occupied had frequently been examined. Still, the object was faint, and the weather uncommonly clear, and a possibility existed of this too. It was a nebula, not before observed. So they observed again on the 2nd of October, and guess what? It had moved. Mariah then thought it very likely, well, if she'd seen it, George Bond would have seen it too. Her father wrote to William Bond on the 3rd of October. As it happened, the 3rd of October was the first, a when the time the post was able to leave Nantucket after the 1st of October, the famous first post, because of rough seas. Um, and the letter arrived on the 7th of October. Well, it turned out that George hadn't spotted the comet, but he teased Mariah by describing just how close to it he had been sweeping on that night. So it was a completely normal procedure for the Mitchells to send their interesting observations and possible discoveries to the Bonds. William Bond sent a note about Mitchell's discovery and other observations of the comet made between the 1st and 11th of October to the monthly notices. And this is the report um, from the, that issue of the monthly notices. Um, it's preceded, incidentally, by observations of Triton, the recently discovered then satellite of Neptune. And this was published in November 1847. It clearly established that Mitchell was the first discoverer. Meanwhile, Francesco Di Vico, who first observed the comet on the 3rd of October, and who duly reported it to Schumacher, qualified for the Danish medal because of the strict rules. In fact, there's no evidence at all that either the Mitchells or the Bonds knew anything about the Danish medal, and the, even less about the rules attached to them. However, there was someone at Harvard who did know about the medal. And this was the president of the college, Edward Everett. Though he wasn't a scientist, Everett took a great interest in astronomy, and he recognized the importance of science. And he also had a very strong academic and diplomatic connections in Europe from his previous career. Everett was tremendously proud of the great refractor newly installed and he wanted to promulgate this to the world and because he'd spent time in 
Europe. He was very anxious that the Europeans should now know what sort of a telescope his college had got, and what they could do with it. Um, and uh, now, he, uh, so Everett had sent to Schumacher an account of the Great Refractor for publication in AN, with a note of some observations made by George Bond of a comet which they knew had been discovered by Victor Mauve on the 4th of July. Now, in his response to this communication, Schumacher told Everett about the Danish Comet Medals. So it was Everett who sent Schumacher details of Mariah's 1st of October discovery, and his communication was published in AN on the 9th of December. Now, I hope you're building a timeline of this in your head, because, uh, you know, Mariah discovers it uh, on the 1st. Um, they, they communicate with the Bonds on the 3rd, uh, the letter arrives on the 7th. Um, the Bonds then send it off to, to, to monthly notices and it gets published in November. Uh, and meanwhile, we've got Divico doing his thing with AN and then Everett um, sends off this um, uh, to, to AN. Um, but um, so it was obviously clear that, that the rules hadn't been followed. Nevertheless, Everett was um, not going to give up on this one easily. Having learnt about this medal, um, apart from feeling that justice should be done for Mitchell, Everett was very conscious of the prestige and the publicity to be gained from this, uh, from the US uh, comet discovery. Now, it was a chance to get high profile recognition in Europe for an American achievement. And we could see what a low level American astronomy was at this time. It, and it could only enhance by um, sort of reflected glory, the status of Harvard. So with the permission of William Mitchell, he put all his very considerable diplomatic and oratorical skills into a campaign to secure a medal for Mariah, even though it was plain that the rules had not been followed. <coughs> so Everett wrote to Schumacher and he lobbied the ex-president the ex-RAS president, William Smythe, who in turn contacted Airy. Well, they were all rather sympathetic for Mariah's case, but the rules was the rules. And eventually, all agreed there was only one way forward, and that was to petition the King of Denmark himself directly, and that that should be done through the American legation in Copenhagen. Now, by this time, a new king had ascended the throne. Uh, the previous one had died. We've, got, we've now got Frederick VII, but he had been pleased to, con uh, to uh, continue with the medal scheme. So it was the US Chargé de Fer who wrote to the King, king Frederick on the 6th of September in 1848. And he wrote in very diplomatic language, of the commendable delicacy which accounted for why Mariah did not hastily seek public notoriety. And he concluded, as the claimant is a young lady of great diffidence, the place a retired island remote from all the high roads of communication, as the conditions have not been well understood in this country, and especially as there was substantial compliance with them, I hope His Majesty may think Miss Mariah Mitchell entitled to the medal. Well, how could the king's heart not be softened by this? He was persuaded. And the medal for Mariah reached Everett in March 1849. It turned out that the medals awarded for 1847 were the last. The competition had to be discontinued in 1840 because um, full-scale war broke out between Denmark and its German neighbour over the disputed Schleswig-Holstein territory. Well, it just sort of leaves me now to make some um, concluding uh, remarks about this, this episode. Um, we can see here again this um, famous portrait of um, Maria Mitchell painted by Hermione Dassel and the, the gold medal, which was awarded to her. But, um, both of those remain with the Mariah Mitchell Association. Uh, 
The reasons given by the king to the king by the charge d'affaires as to why Mariah did not comply with the rules, I think at best are only half the scory and somewhat exaggerated. They were calculated to have the desired effect on the king, and they worked. But in my view, that was at some cost to Mariah's reputation for scientific skill and integrity as an observer. She was one of the best observational astronomers in the US at the time, and also perfectly capable of calculating the orbit of her comet herself. Too many times she's been romantically portray portrayed as a shy and retiring young woman who accidentally turned a telescope on the sky and captured a comet. Well, nothing could be further from the truth, as I hope I've demonstrated to you. Um, this highly posed coloured portrait of her, I think, has does little to dispel the myth. Um, apparently, Mariah herself didn't care for it, and rather objected to it being painted in that way. But fortunately, her subsequent career, <coughs> which culminated in her appointment as Professor of Astronomy at Vassar College, did show the world a very different character, a, very, a pioneering, capable, confident woman, even domineering in times. And, and Everett, well, he had good reason to be satisfied with what he'd achieved. The award of the medal to an American citizen bolstered the morale of US astronomers and stimulated more philanthropists to donate funds for telescopes and observatories. And exceptionally for this time, he'd championed the idea that a woman could aspire to be recognized for an astronomical achievement on a level with her male colleagues. And I like to think that he and the King of Denmark together created a unique springboard from which Mariah could open up astronomical opportunities for women, which um, in her position at Vassar College, she most certainly did and set up a succession of, um, of women who followed her. Uh, and I have to add there at the end, um, that that was that the last, almost, uh, no, not the last, but one of those people was Vera Rubin, whose biography I've just written, following the succession through. Vera chose to go to Vassar College because of Mariah Mitchell. So it's a complete circle for me, in a way. And that brings me to the end of my talk. I'm, if there's time, I'm very happy to answer questions, if there are questions I know the answer to. Uh, if, if you're on the people on the watching on YouTube can also ask questions through the live chat if they feel like it. Uh, any uh, questions or comments from here, Nick, who's director of the comment section? <laughs> of course. Yes, I would, I would definitely emphasise that comments are very exciting things to do. You, you mentioned about the, the, the medals and the fact that you haven't got a complete list of all of the medals. <laughs> Do we know actually how many of the medals were of this? So Mariah Mitchell definitely. Do we know about any of the others? Yes. Um, there's well, I know about two, and I know about one that's gone missing from somewhere not very far from here. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, the two that I know about, one is um, at uh, Georgetown uh, University in um, the United States, but I think that's one of DeVico's. Um, and Brawson's medal is in a museum in Copenhagen. And the one that's gone missing was at the Royal Astronomical Society. And it was, ex it was exhibited in, um, uh, when the, uh, at the centenary exhibition, it, was, it would have been in the, um, in the 1970s, I think. And I tracked down in a quarterly journal, a catalog of what was put on display in the library on this exhibition. And there it was, this medal, DeVico. So I, I immediately contacted the librarian, current librarian and archivist, and apparently searches have been made and the medal cannot be found. And um, so what I would say is if there's anybody here who knows anything about the whereabouts of the medals or can throw any light at all on any of the other 
um, winners of the medals, I'd be delighted to hear from you because this is unfinished business for me. Thank you. Any other questions? Over there. And the... Um, thanks, thanks, thanks for a fascinating broadcast. Um, I, I assume the picture that is actually Mariah's medal is stamped with King Christian Yates. Ah, it, 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 who was the king? The pre I, pre I think they. Pre I'm, as, I'm assuming that they, they simply didn't change the design of the, of the medal. You know, that would have been kept, yes. Um. Any others? Over here. Um, maybe it's a slightly up the subject, but whilst we're talking about the history of comets, when was it we first had an inkling of what comets were? Um, because I think they were meteorological in nature. One mistake, we thought they were. Oh. Maybe well, it was Tycho Brahe who first established yes. the comets are beyond the Earth's orbit. Yes, it was about then. Yeah. Yes, it was. He, he worked out that yes, it was a comet was further than the moon. That's right. Yes, that, that's probably so the, the really important so, thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then, and then when Halley calculated the, the orbit, yeah. I mean that definitely showed that they were other members of the solar system, so, not linked to Earth. <laughs> but of course. Um, the nature of comets was still not understood. And I mean, you know, I was mentioning that I joined the BAA because I got, uh, I got um, uh, <clears throat> to know somebody who was uh, um, doing c computing cometary orbits. I had the exciting um, experience of doing the first computations on an electronic computer that appeared in the journal because I went... I did what I suppose now would have been called an internship in 1966 with a computer firm. And um, I had, uh, we, we were sort of playing at <clears throat> um, uh, proving what the computer could do by calculate, um, doing some um, ephemerides. And also, I had to go at um, predicting the return of cometary uh, of a comet doing um, the, the orbit. Because prior to that, um, it had all been done by people who spent the whole of the winter um, computing one orbit uh, by chunking by hand on a Brunsviga calculator. So, um, <coughs> uh, so yes, well, where, where were we? What was, what was the question I was actually answering about? Well, it's, it's when so, people first realised comets were... The BAA has a really <laughs> proud history in, yes. in computing the orbits of comets. It Brian, does. Brian Marsden, who eventually yes. ended up at Harvard. Yes. Of course, came from a, a BAA background. Yes, I know what I was going to say, that even then, and following up, when I was in Cambridge studying, I knew Ray Littleton. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking back to then, in the 60s and 70s, how little was still understood about comets. I know when I was doing those orbits, Ort had mentioned the possibility of his cloud, but there was a lot of scepticism about whether it really existed, because there weren't enough comets with decent orbits to be able to trace them back far enough to say where they'd come from. And we hadn't got close enough observations to be able to work out what the nature of comets were. And um, Whipple was coming up with um, the idea of the uh, dirty snowballs. And Ray Littleton didn't believe it. He, and so you know, it, it, even back in the 60s and 70s, I think they were still really mysterious objects. Um, and it seems such a different world now, where we, we've got landed something on a comet. <laughs> Any other comments? <coughs> I've got no comments on that on Zoom that I can see, on YouTube that I can see. Okay. Can I just... Yes. Uh, were the, I mean, one of the things about this medal is that it seemed to want instant communication. And yet in the... 17 years or so, I think communication had changed that. I mean, snail mail were just about the only thing available at the beginning. And I just wondered whether they were making any attempt to use modern communications by the end of the period to notify discoveries. Um, well, I was sort of thinking to back to what little I know about postal history. I mean, I have known a little bit about postal history, but I think that. Um, not a lot of change, to be honest. Um, uh, uh, that is the, the, the kind of posts that, that would have been referred to in the 1830s hadn't really changed by the 
the, the, the 1840s. And, and of course, there was this provision that if the posts hadn't been established in this remote place, you could send it by carrier pigeon, apparently, so, or whatever, you know, so. Um, I'm thinking of when did Brunel lay his cable and things like that. Well, the, the telegraph telegraph in, much, in, much in England probably started in the 1850s or maybe six, early 60s, but I wouldn't have thought it would have got to America anyway. I don't know. I don't know enough about it. No, sure. I, I wouldn't like to. I wouldn't like to say. No. Anyway, thank you very much for for listening, everyone, and uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, to join you. Thank you very much. Jeffrey. I think that that all this all that business about Nantucket reminds me of the story of Moby Dick. If you want to know more about. Nantucket Island in the 19th century. That's well, all in. Give us a limerick. That's all in. Um, <laughs> no, that's that's all in uh, Herman, Herman Melville's novel. It's, it's all about uh, Nantucket. So uh, we're moving on to more, much more modern topics. Bang up to date. Martin Lewis is a well-known observer. He's a professional engineer, and uh, he's a. Planetary imager, he's a telescope builder, he's built some lovely Dobsonian telescopes, uh, and he's, uh, he, he, he uh, restarted as a visual observer, sketching all kinds of objects, and he's also an excellent sketcher of deep sky objects. Uh, recently been working with his uh, home-built 444 and 222 millimeter Dobsonian telescopes uh, from his garden in St. Albans. Uh, on planetary imaging, and I would say he's one of the leaders in the world on that. He's been a prize winner at the Astronomy Photographer of the Year competition for the last few years. He won first and second prize in the planets category in 2018, and he's also equipment advisor to the BA Equipment and Techniques section. He's also treasurer of the West of London Astronomical Society, and he's been uh, publishing some very useful articles recently in the journal. So today, he's going to tell you about his uh, adventures doing uh, a new project, uh, which very few people in the world have accomplished, that is imaging the night side of Venus in infrared light. So please welcome Martin Lewis to tell you about that. Thank you very much, David, and welcome everyone. Um, let me just put the presentation up. Oh, ah, good. Okay, so this is a talk about my attempt at imaging, um, looking through the clouds of Venus and imaging the night side of Venus, which I attempted in 2020, the very good evening apparition in 2020 from the Northern Hemisphere. So here is the 2020 evening apparition as viewed from 50 degrees north. This is from a very good website, which is called nakedeyeplanets.com, which is uh, managed by Martin Powell. And um, very nice apparition image here, showing um, 30, degree, 30 minutes after sunset um, from uh, November 2019 through till inferior conjunction, right at the beginning of June 2020. And you can see um, reached quite a high altitude of about 35 degrees, 30 minutes after sunset um, in the April sort of May period. So every interesting coincidence that 13 Venusian years is almost exactly eight Earth years. Um, so that means that every eight years, Venus um, ends up in same place in the sky with almost exactly the same phase. Um, so it, there's seven years and 364 days um, and that explains with transits why there's an eight year interval between transits and then a long gap again because that one day uh, makes all the difference for it to come round again. So during that eight year period there are five evening apparitions and five morning apparitions and from these sort of climbs, 
Um, two of the evening apparitions are good, three are poor, and two of the morning apparitions are good and three are poor. So 2020 was one of the good apparitions for uh, Northern Hemisphere observers, and Venus was uh, visible in the evening sky for about six months. So I made the most of the apparition to do some imaging of Venus. This is my main imaging scope, which I do most of my planetary imaging, which is a 444 millimeter homemade Dobsonian on an equatorial platform, which is also homemade. Um, so that's in my garden in St Albans. And I also use a telescope of half the aperture, a bit more portable, also on the same equatorial platform. So here are some images of Venus taken during that period um, in infrared with an 807 nanometer uh, infrared filter, all with uh, my larger scope. Um, towards the end of the period where Venus was getting low, it disappeared behind trees southwest of me. Um, I came home on the 19th of May, and to my delight, my neighbours, completely unprompted, had chopped eight metres off the top of a conifer tree there, <laughs> and Venus was available for imaging. So um, I got quite a nice image then on the 19th of May, again with the 807 nanometer filter. So that was infrared. I also took the opportunity to do some uh, imaging through a BARDA ultraviolet filter, and that filter allows you to really bring out um, details in the thick sulfuric uh, acid clouds of Venus there and see some structure. Um, probably my best image was this one here showing some quite fine structure on the 24th of April. Um, as I said, um, Venus is surrounded by these very thick clouds of sulfuric acid, um, which completely hides the view um, from visible light. But with a narrow band filter centered around a thousand nanometers, the clouds become transparent, almost completely transparent. And then on the unilluminated side, you can see the thermal radiation from the surface, from the hot surface, surfaces around 470 degrees. And you can see that radiation and you can see variations in that radiation which relate to topographical features. So the higher areas are cooler, and the lower areas are brighter in those wavelengths. So with that apparition being so good, I wondered about having a go at imaging the night side of Venus. So I'd read Richard McKim's article in the October 2017 journal, which I found very inspirational. Um, and it talked about attempts by Anthony Wesley and Phil Miles in, uh, in Australia, who had imaged, who've, who've done this thousand nanometer imaging and had um, imaged topographical features on the surface. And um, it seemed an enormous challenge. And I did speak to Anthony about this um, at the Juno RES meeting a couple of years after that. So here's Phil Miles and Anthony Wesley with Phil Miles's. 508 millimeter Newtonian, and you can see there um, some images that they took um, showing, in particular, as a, a quite a, I don't know if you can see this, uh, quite a distinctive shape, which is probably the most distinctive feature on the surface, which is an area called Aphrodite. And what was of particular interest was this bright spot here, um, which seemed to indicate the possibility that there might be recent volcanic activity on the surface. So they, they were very keen that um, they would follow up observations to see if that still existed. So here's um, the uh, spectrum of, of Venus um, from one nanometer, so some from one micron, 1,000 nanometer up to 2.5 microns. And the area, the particular area of interest is this 1,000 to 1,020 nanometers. So here, this is where you're looking through the atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is transparent. Venus's atmosphere is transparent. And 96% of that radiation 
is thermal radiation from the, from the surface. At um, longer wavelengths, um, you have other things like oxygen air glow and water air, water glow and so, and so on. <coughs> but um, if you restrict imaging to those wavelengths, then you've got a chance of seeing topographical features. So Wesley and Mars had used a combination of two filters. So a notch filter, a SEMROC notch filter from 850 to 1020 nanometers, and then um, another filter starting at 1,000 nanometers onwards. So that combination <coughs> meant they then had um, a filter combination that allowed those wavelengths from 1,000 to 1,020 nanometers. Trouble was that that came to about 600 pounds for those two filters, um, which was beyond my pocket. However, chance conversation with Paul Abel and David Arditti um, about imaging the night side of Venus suggested I apply for a BAA Wrigley grant. Um, and that was for up to a thousand pound for uh, purchase of equipment for this sort of task. I applied for that, and in record speed, that was approved. Um, and um, I, I really appreciate the BAA doing that, um, because this this uh, imaging wouldn't have been possible without that. So I I, I had a grant and uh, bought my filters. Um, this is the filter. So at the same time. Um, as this was happening, I was in communication with Anthony Wesley, and he told me that a new filter had just come out, a single filter, an Edmonds filter, um, which was from, which was centered around 1,000 nanometers with a 25 nanometer bandwidth, um, which might be perfect for this task. So I bought one of those, um, which was around 200 pounds, um, it does, it's not designed for screwing into eyepieces, so I had to make a holder, make a baffle tube, and so on. Um, so, I had a filter, I had a telescope, the time was right, but there were so many questions to, to answer, and I, time was running out. You know, Venus was there, it was prime imaging time, I had a narrow window of just a few weeks, the filter came quickly, um, but so many questions. Fortunately, um, Anthony was on a hand and he gave me a, uh, a leg up and, and suggested certain settings for the camera and imaging um, to help me um, with my first session. So um, here's my scope set up in my garden, ready for Venus imaging. Um, with laptop, so just for, the, for those of you who don't know, with planetary imaging, you take a video, so you take a lot of frames. Um, you, because you've got a lot of frames, you can throw away any that are um, blurred by poor seeing, and you can bring them all together and stack them, superimpose them and align them. And what that allows you to do is to effectively have a very long exposure but made up of short exposures. So the advantage of short exposures is if it moves due to the scope blowing or atmospheric turbulence, it, it doesn't move much because you've got a short exposure, but then you add them all together and that dramatically reduces shot noise and it allows you then to stretch the image and bring out contrast. So, as I say, the time was short um, I made the application for the Ridley grant on the 13th of April. It was approved just two days later. Um, and I got my filter the following day. And my first attempt was six days after my grant application. So I was right in there. Um, and I had really until, I had about a month then, until Venus was going to be uh, too low in the sky. And... Um, no chance of, of imaging the night side. So, um, first serious attempt was on the 24th of April, which was good, good.
good seeing and in the dark sky. But I wasn't that familiar with all the settings and so on. Um, but fortunately, just a few days later, at the beginning of May, I had really good seeing, dark sky, um, and it was in prime position, and that was the prime period. And then by uh, towards the end of May, just too low, too low. Although in the dark sky, it was very low in, in the sky, in the dark sky, seeing is a problem. And then you've only got, you know, 20 minutes and then Venus has set. But I was very lucky. So this was uh, lockdown 2020. And as you know, um, the day lockdown was announced, there was this fantastic period of very good weather. Um, lots of sunshine for vitamin D to help with respiratory diseases. Um, so here is a, a solar can image that I took from uh, my same garden that period from, so this is from December the 30th at the bottom with the sun close to winter solstice all the way up to summer solstice at the top. And you see that really bright band in the middle that um, starts around March the 23rd and then you've got, you know, weeks and weeks of sunshine there shown in that uh, solar graph. So that's a path of the sun just through a pinhole camera um, and just left um, exposing for six months. So here are my first images. Um, at the top there, you can see arrowed these very dark areas. Um, and you can see how noisy the images are. So these are many minutes of exposure, accumulated exposure. But they do show these vague, mark, vague darker marks in the same areas. Um, so I started with um, a camera that um, was also bought with a Ridley Clark grant, which was a copy of the same camera that Wesley and Miles has used. So I knew the camera would be right and would do the job. Um, so I used that, but I also tried some other cameras. I tried a, an IR sensitive um, ASI 290 camera, which was a disaster, um, and tried out a number of cameras. And one that worked very well was my ASI 174 camera, which had big pixels. It's designed for um, solar and uh, lunar imaging. It's got large pixels, and that worked really well. So here is um, probably the best night. And you can see this particular area here, this cross-shaped area, and some dark areas here, which you, you may think are, you know, are just noise, but they keep appearing in the same place night after night. So this is um, what you can do is combine data for several nights. So there's a program called WinDupos, and it allows you to take images where a planet has rotated and derotate it to a common time. So you can take um, several days' data and combine them together and derotate them to one night, and that helps reduce noise and bring out detail. And then these these darker areas are now significantly clearer because you've um, taken the noise away. So here is um, that same data with a, in a more aesthetic view. And that's 72 minutes exposure. So that's 72 minutes accumulated exposure, you know, well over an hour made up of 200 millisecond exposures, thousands and thousands and thousands of them crunched together to, um, to reduce noise. That big cross that you see there is the diffraction, um, the diffraction of the secondary veins on my telescope. So we have a mirror at the top of the telescope with metal veins that hold it, and those cause a diffraction pattern, and that's that big cross that you see there. So as May went on, um, I continued imaging, but Venus, although Venus was getting larger, and the, night, the day side crescent smaller, and so the night side larger. It was getting lower in the sky. Um, imaging sessions were shorter and shorter. 
and so images end up, ended up noisier and noisier. So the best ones were early May. So this was my last session on the 20th of May. So that day, Wix had opened for the first time. So I rushed down Wix, bought some concrete blocks, and was able to elevate the telescope by 18 inches to look over the garden fence. And by pulling a bush down with a, with a wire, I uh, was able to get my last, my last photons, uh, my last 1,000 nanometer photons um, of Venus. <coughs> so here's an animation. And hopefully you can see those vague, darker markings moving with the days as Venus slowly rotates. So it's a 243-day rotation period of Venus retrograde. So over several days, it moves slowly. And then here, so what I've done here is superimpose um, uh, a Magellan probe topographical map um, on top of my image. And you can see this area here, which is Beta Regio, an area here. This little dark area, I, I hadn't thought was of any significance. I thought that was noise, but it coincides exactly with that dark spot here. And then you've got this cross-shaped region most distinctive, which is Beta Regio, which you can see on the Magellan data. So it is real. It's real stuff. <coughs> so um, here is, um, in WinDupos, you can unwind it and make a map. So, you know, I can't do the whole surface, but this is my map showing those areas and marking them, and then you can see this. This is this Y-shaped area here, and then this is this Beta Regio, and you've got Ultron Regio and Asteria Regio and all these odd names. So another coincidence with Venus is that 13 Venusian years is almost exactly 12 rotations of the planet retrograde. And what that means is that every evening apparition of those five you see the same face of Venus. And every morning apparition, you see the same face, a different face, but <coughs> it's the same face every morning apparition. So if you want to see Aphrodite, the area and this hot spot, you can't do it in the evening. You have to do it in a morning apparition, which is a shame because I've got a terrible eastern horizon. So I'm stuck with morning with uh, evening apparition. So this is my last image of Venus. So this is three degrees from the sun, um, two days before inferior conjunction. So this was the culmination of 27 sessions of Venus. And uh, that was the, that's the image. So I'm looking just a little bit above the sun there with a the sunscreen, which I've got a rope because it was quite a breezy day. Um, <laughs> So I had to tie that down with guy ropes, and I'm just peeking just above that, um, and that, that sunscreen prevents any light entering the telescope, which obviously would cause significant problems um, if sunlight hit the mirror, but also the sun will warm up the inside of the tube and cause convection currents that then destroys the resolution. So that was on the 31st of May. So that's, that was my attempts at imaging. Um, but I, I learned an awful lot. It's a completely different sort of imaging than I'd ever been used to before. Um, and I wanted to um, outline a few things that I've learned um, in the project that will help others if they want to have a go themselves. So I'm going to talk about when in the apparition it's best to image, effects of sky brightness, Stacking, how many to stack, what rate F ratio to use, and then a bit about cameras and processing. So, when to image? Um, so, to be stand the best chance of seeing the night sky, night side, you have to image when Venus is a crescent. Um, obviously, 
as it, as it um, becomes more crescent shaped, it becomes larger. So the night side um, is a larger proportion of the planet's surface, and the night, the, the day side, which is overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly bright, becomes smaller. Um, what you find is because you have the, the night side is so much dimmer than the day side, you have to, by necessity, the day side will be massively overexposed, overexposed and it bloats and becomes much larger. Um, and anything uh, more than about 40% phase, that day side just completely overwhelms the night side. So that, that's a limit at the, at the, um, the large phase side. And then as it gets smaller, as I said, Venus gets larger. Sorry, as the, as the phase gets smaller, Venus gets larger, nearer to Earth. Um, the, night, the day side uh, becomes less overwhelming. Fantastic. But then it drops in the sky, and your, the time before its setting is... is uh, Massively reduced, so your sessions become shorter, slower in the sky, the seeing is worse, and that's what kills you. So, probably you've got about a five week window um, to image Venus, either side of inferior conjunction, probably from about a 40% phase to a 5% phase. So, you can see 19th of April. Uh, that's 35% phase, so it's quite a decent crescent, but it's, below, it's, it's almost completely overwhelmed the night side there. And then on the, 7th, on the 20th of May, which is my last session, you can just see how noisy it is because the seeing is poor, so it's scrubbed any features, and the session is short, so it's very noisy. So probably from about a 40% phase to a 5% phase, which is about five weeks. So you can see on um, Martin Powell's um, image here of that apparition, you know, it's, you've got six months here, and then you've got a month from here to here, and this is the best period from about 30% phase to 15% <coughs> phase. That's prime period, which is about j just a few weeks. So... Sky brightness. So when, before I started this, I thought the big problem is going to be the day side, just the fact that that's overwhelmingly bright and um, I need to reduce scatter in the telescope, scatter in the optics, and that's the big, the big deal. But actually the big deal is the fact that the night side is so dim and the sky is so bright that the noise from the day from the, from the sky brightness overwhelms the, the dimness of the, of the night side and it makes the image very noisy. And that, makes, that means it's very difficult for these subtle variations in the infrared radiation to show through and that's what you want. You want to see those topographical features. Um, so it's a bit, a bit like imaging, deep sky imaging in a light polluted sky. It's completely different from normal planetary imaging. Um, so with deep sky imaging, a lot of it is about long exposures to reduce noise. And that's what this, that's what this, um, this particular challenge told me, that it's about gathering as much data as you can and uh, in as dark a sky as you can. So a large aperture helps um, and use it at prime focus. So you're condensing the light, making it as small as possible on the chip um, to reduce shot noise. So let's talk a bit about the sky brightness. Why is that a problem? Why can't you just subtract it off? You know, surely it's uniform. You can just subtract it off everything and the night side will will show through. Well, here's a schematic to explain why that isn't the case. So on the left-hand side, you've got a perfectly dark sky. So you've got the night side. Now I'm talking about electrons here. So when the photons hit the sensor, 
uh, hit a pixel in the sensor, they generate electrons, and that's what you measure. So typically, for the camera that I was using um, with that chip and my setup, um, the night side would be around about nine electrons generated <coughs> in each pixel during one frame. Now, there's a simple rule to work out what the noise is. You just do the square root of nine. So the noise would be three. So you'd have a signal of nine <coughs> electrons and a noise of three electrons. So the signal to noise would be, or a single frame, would be three. However, go over to this side, and you've got a sky that's 64 electrons, so much, much brighter than the day side. So the noise is root 64 is 8. Now, on the night side, you've got your original 9 electrons, but, but you've got 64 electrons on top of it. If you square root that, you've got a noise of 8.5 electrons. So you've got a much higher noise. So now you've got a 9 electron night side with a noise of 8.5 electrons, so your signal to noise is 1.1, and that's the problem. So here are some real measurements um, that bring it <coughs> home. So these are measurements that I made of the sky brightness, four different altitudes of the sun during my imaging sessions. So the different symbols are the different times that I imaged. And you can see this curve, so you can see it goes all the way up to, so here we've got sunset, so the sun's on the horizon, and the sky brightness is 800 electrons. So as the sun drops down, so the sky gets darker and darker and darker, but even when it's, you know, six degrees below the horizon, you've still got a sky brightness of 20 or so electrons for a night side brightness that is 11 electrons. Um, so I've got two examples here. So here the sun is about three degrees below the horizon. The sky is 100 electrons. Here it's just set. My brightness is 500 electrons. And this is what happens. So you can see there on the left-hand side, that's with the sun just set, almost a degree below the horizon. And you can see how much noisier that is than the one on the right, which is a darker sky. So that's got a much worse signal-to-noise ratio than this one. So that's, this is a stack of 810 frames. So it's um, a, effectively a three-minute exposure um, with each exposure at about 200 milliseconds. So... As I've alluded to, the key to all this is, is gathering lots of frames. Um, and I want to show you some examples of what happens if you take a single frame. So on the left-hand side, you've got a single frame. You can see how hellish noisy it is. Possibly just about make out the dark sky, dark side there. When you stack 10 frames, you start to see the night side coming through. 100 frames. So as you stack more and more, the signal grows, but because the, the noise is the square root of the signal, that grows as well, but it grows at a slower rate. So if you've got 100 frames, um, you've got 100 times the signal, but you've only got 10 times the shot noise. So the signal to noise improves by a factor of 10. And then here you are. Once you get to 400 frames or 800 frames, then you start to see these features. They start to come through. But you need these long exposures, so that's um, three minutes um, total exposure, accumulated <coughs> exposure. So it, if, the, if the atmosphere was perfectly steady, you could do a three-minute exposure, just open the shutter for three minutes, and you'd get that level of noise. So... Talking now about F-ratio, so, so for planetary imaging, you normally um, image at quite high magnification. And there's a rule called the Nyquist rule, and you need about three pixels across your smallest feature, which is usually, usually your um, 
decided by your diffraction limit of your optics. So there's a simple rule that planetary imagers use um, that um, is a rule of thumb that satisfies the Nyquist, and that's that you have an F ratio, which is three to five times the pixel size in microns. Really simple rule. Um, and that, that sets optical wavelengths, obviously, at 1,000 nanometers. The diffraction image, uh, features are much larger. The wavelength is longer. So that works out about one and a half to two and a half, uh, an F ratio of one and a half to two and a half times the pixel size. So the camera I was using, we, I should be imaging at F9 to F6, F15, something like that. But I actually chose um, a much lower F ratio, and that's because the features are quite big. The overwhelming problem is noise, is shot noise. Um, if I'd have been imaging at those sort of F ratios, the light would be spread over a much larger area of the chip, and all my noise problems would be much worse. Uh, so camera choice. So idea, the ideal digital video camera for night side, night side imaging um, would have a high sensitivity at 1,000 nanometers. It would have low read noise, but it wouldn't necessarily be mono. So there's a number of cameras that have come out from Sony recently with quite peculiar um, uh, spectral responses. And what you find is there are a number of cameras around at the moment that um, essentially are mono in the infrared. So beyond 800 nanometers, the red response, the blue response, and the green response is similar and also very high. So they're designed to be used in the infrared. So if you block all this off, they act like normal color cameras. And then if you put an 800 nanometer filter in that allows this through, they're effectively mono cameras. So there are a number around, one of which the most famous is the IMX, is, is, uses the IMX 462 chip, color chip. Um, now I've got at the bottom, no spurious reflections. And I did mention with this ASI 290, which was uh, an IR sensitive camera, was unusable. And this is why. Okay. So you get multiple reflections. So there's a, no, a lot of cameras at the moment. And you can see um, and the IMX178, which is uh, you know, a popular imaging chip in planetary imaging cameras, hopeless. This is the 290, and you can see. So this is the basic image. You can see all these multiple images, which are images of the day side, the very, very bright day side, reflect inside the chip. And you can play around with the focus and focus a bit deeper into the chip. And then they become nice and sharp. And you can see how the outer ones become sharp if you focus inwards by 1.6 millimeters. If you focus in by just 0.8 of a millimeter, the intercept becomes sharp. If you rotate the camera, they all rotate. So it's like a kaleidoscope. It's absolutely useless. <laughs> so I did some tests. Recently, I've been meaning to do these tests for a long while, but with this talk coming up, this was the incentive. So I made a 0.4 millimeter pinhole, which was actually <coughs> the pinhole from the solar camera that I used, the solar can camera um, that showed the solar graph with the sun's path. I cut it's done inside a, a, like a beer can with a ring pull. So I opened it and um, had taken the film out, taken the, the, the photographic paper out. That was my image. But the can I had lying around, and it had a perfectly round 0.4 millimeter pinhole. So I put that in front of a, a halogen lamp and, and had a, a 0.4 millimeter pinhole at one and a half meters away and imaged it with different cameras um, through the 1,000 nanometer filter. And you can see this is the ASI 290, terrible. The 462, which was super IR sensitive and very promising, that's not quite as bad, but it's not great. The 482 
has some lobes up here. I don't know if you can see, you probably can't see them on the screen there. So it does have some lobes, but it's got all this rubbish on the inside, which is a bit worrying. Um, the 224, which is a popular, a very popular color camera, that's got a problem. This is a very basic camera. This is one of uh, the first pl uh, cameras from a company called ZWA, the ZWO that make uh, planetary imaging cameras. Fairly clean, but horribly noisy. Lots of read noise with that. And then this is the camera I used, um, which gives a very clean image. So at the bottom here, I've got the comparative size uh, that, that Venus would be on the chip compared to this. So you can get an idea of the scale of that relative to the separation of the dots. So there may well be better cameras out there, but out of the set of cameras that I've got, the ASI 174, although not very IR sensitive, does give very clean images. So camera settings. So um, I spent a lot of time analyzing my images to try and understand why some Im images were better than others. And, um, discovered all this about sky brightness and the importance of sky brightness and so on. So what I did is I built a calculator. So I took all my data, crunched it down, simplified it, and built a model that allows you to put in four different cameras, different exposure times, um, different gains, the read noise, uh, the shot noise, the sky brightness, and it comes out with a signal to noise ratio. So I'm not going to go through that in any sort of detail at all. But just as an example of what I found is that um, long exposures are needed. So if you, with that camera, it's got big pixels, as I said, a 200 millisecond exposure, which is ridiculously long for planetary imaging. I get nervous if I expose, if I have a, a frame time that's longer than about 20 milliseconds. That really worries me. So this is 200 milliseconds, which was, but Anthony Wesley, you know, he, his results spoke. He said, try that long exposure. Um, and then after I'd done all this, I was able to understand why that was important. And that's because at 200 millisecond exposures, you get 11, 11 electrons per pixel per frame. But if you use a short exposure, you only get about one electron per pixel per, per frame. Very, very small. Um, and this is what happens. So um, in a bright sky, the read noise at 200 milliseconds is tiny. Don't worry about it. Um, in the same way that if you're deep sky imaging and you've got a very bright sky, you know, from a town or something like that, don't worry too much about read noise. Um, it's only when you've got really dark skies that read noise comes into play and becomes as important as shot noise. At minus five degrees, a night dark, nice dark sky, read noise is still quite small. But if you had a 25 millisecond exposure, when the sky is dark, you get a lot of noise from the noise of the camera. And that really impacts the signal to noise. So you'd be reducing your signal to noise from 44 down to 25 for a three minute exposure. So long exposures are required. Um, gain, as you increase gain of modern planetary imaging cameras, the read noise drops. And you can see that as you get up to, this is 30 decibels, um, the, the read noise levels out. So choose a highish gain on your camera to reduce read noise. Um, but don't worry about it too much in a bright sky because it's only in the darker skies that that read noise comes into play. Um, so cameras can be used, normal planetary imaging cameras are used just with an 8-bit eight, eight bit, bit depth. That means you've got 256 gray levels. Um, but they can also be used at 16-bit. 
16 bit is actually not really 16 bit, it's only 12 bit. But you've basically got, instead of 256 levels, you've got 4,000 gray levels. Why does that matter? Well, here's some, you know, 200 millisecond exposure. If it was eight bits, your night side is only two and a half gray levels. How on earth are you going to pick out variations in gray levels, you know, and see your topographical features if you've only got two, two or three gray levels for the whole of the, the night side? If you work at 16 bit, you've got 42 gray levels, you've got a chance. If you're at these short exposures, you've got no chance. You've got no chance if you're 8 bit, and you've got very little chance if you're, tw if you're 12 bit. So go to the 16 bit setting on your camera. So, last of all, um, how do you process it? So, you've got your video, you uh, run it through something like um, auto stacker, which aligns up all the individual images, <coughs> then put it into Registax and do some wavelet processing. So a little bit of tweaking to sharpen it up. But why is my night side? I can't see my night side. How does that come out? Well, that comes out just by changing gamma and doing a bit of a histogram stretch. So you can see that's the same image, gamma of 1.6 and do a bit of a histogram stretch, and the night side miraculously appears. Um, so that, that's when, that's in a dark sky, and then you can see in a bright sky, you can see how much noisier it is when you do that. So, up to date now, so we've just had the morning apparition of Venus. Um, here is uh, an image from uh, obliquity.com website that uh, I kindly got permission to use, and that shows how dreadful a, a morning apparition it was for us in the UK. Um, didn't even reach 20 degrees high. Um, and now it's well past that 40% phase. It passed through dichotomy a few days ago. But from Australia, mm -hmm. they're very lucky. So they've got, they had a fantastic apparition with Venus, so where Wesley and Miles are um, up to 40 degrees high. Fantastic. So Anthony kindly has allowed me to use one of his, uh, some of his images. Um, absolutely staggeringly good images. Um, and you can actually see um, cloud details, wispy cloud details here. So these change from day to day. And then you've got these darker features here. Um, so we are moving closer to the question of whether there's current volcanic activity on Venus. Um, so here's uh, one of these uh, Magellan probes. And you can see how the amazing correlation between the altimetry data and the darker features that uh, they've imaged. So this is using uh, a lucid camera that's more optimized for infrared um, and using a higher F ratio than they used previously. So what's coming up? When, when's a good time to have a go at this, if you want to have a go at it? As I said, there's two good uh, evening apparitions and two good morning apparitions every eight years. So that was back in 2020. 2022, morning and evening, pretty terrible. But next year, the morning apparition will be pretty good. So a month after inferior conjunction, Venus will be 26 degrees high. So that will be good. And then three years later, morning apparition will be pretty good. Then the whole thing repeats. So in 2028, you'll be back to what it was in 2020. 2025 will be the next <coughs> good one from the UK in the evening. And then you'll have to wait till 2028. So these are the two good <coughs> evening apparitions. That was... Uh, this was 2020 and will be 2028. 
and 2024-25 will run from October through to late March and be almost as good as this apparition. So that's the next time to have a go. Plenty of time to save up money for a filter or apply for a Ridley grant. Um, so that's my talk. Um, I've got all my images on my website, which is skyinspector.co.uk. So all my Venus images are there. They aren't all tiny thin crescents like that. There are some other stuff there as well, and images of Mercury and other planets, and lots of information about um, planetary imaging in particular, as well as all my astronomy sketches. So I think there's time for questions. <laughs> Martin. Yes, we do have time for some questions. Um, oh, Martin, th yes. thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, all your images uh, neatly got um, the... Yeah, yeah it worked for the microphone. All, um, all your images neatly got uh, the night side of Venus in one of the quadrants of yes. uh, the diffraction uh, spikes. Yeah. I assume that wasn't coincidence. I assume you can rotate... No, um, that was completely top. fortuitous. Oh, right. And I wouldn't have been able to do anything about it if it hadn't been the case. Yes, so, so I was very lucky. It's perfectly fitted perfectly in those veins. Exactly. And probably in the morning, I don't know if it would, if it would do. Um, but no, there was nothing I would have been able to do about it. So some way of fixed. rotating the, um, the secondary mirror support yes. would be very advantageous. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I know... Wesley and Miles have, yeah, I think they have rotated their telescope in order to, um, because they did have a vein crossing right through the night side. But yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Any other questions? Jeremy. Jeremy. That, that's also intriguing me as well. But congratulations on some really, really pioneering work. <coughs> Thank you very much. Amazing. I remember the, the grant approval coming through uh, council, so it was gratifying that you could uh, um, achieve it so quickly. So uh, great. Question, that qu the question I had was, could you do the same with a stochastic range, or does the glass in the corrector float? Uh, yes, and, yes. And, and of course, then you went up with the fraction spike. Yes. Worry about that later. No. I mean, the main problem with the schmidt cassegrain range is the fact that you are inherently at a higher F ratio, you know, um, and that... Um, makes it much larger on the chip. And um, uh, that that's the main problem, is that the F ratio is, you know, in like yes, 10 have, and 15 times. In, but, uh, yeah, in you've, you've done the, it, David. Imaging the um, night side with an F11 SCT. And it's, it gets fainter, so you need a much longer exposure. Uh, like, arguably, even significantly longer exposures. What sort of exposures are we using? Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> Oh, longer than 200 milliseconds, I think. I think it was a second, some of the oh, right. lens we've been. Okay. Uh, and I found that I had to be able to see the night side actually live on the screen. If it was too faint to be seen, then no amount of focusing would bring no. it out. But no. if I could just see it glimmering there, just on the limit of perception yes. in the noise, yes. then something would come out of the corner and focus it. Yes, yes, which is interesting. Yes. Mm -hmm. But yes, it is possible. Uh, but the, not very good if you're not alert operationally. Any other comments? Gosh, <laughs> the other side of the room. <laughs> Yes, I mean it will. It will have an impact, definitely. Um, but it worked. You know, it, it worked, uh, and I didn't have time to experiment with other filter setups. Wesley and Miles have have uh, they using a similar F ratio, or were using a similar F ratio in 2017, and had 
tried a number of different filter combinations. I had no time to experiment, so I just had a go with it, and it worked. There's probably our better filters around. It's, it's early stages. I think there's a lot more that can be done, and you can, you know, in future there will be cameras that will be, won't have those awful reflections, but will be much more sensitive in the IR and probably better filters, and you'll see a lot more detail on the night side. But, uh, yeah, this is early <coughs> stages, really. Any others? I've got a microphone, so can I, can I just ask one? <coughs> yes, those, those reflections in the camera, did you actually get the problem of what was causing them? Are they, are they in the sensor itself, or are they in the package, or the cover glass? Or? Um, I believe they're in the, in the um, sensor material itself, rather than in the cover glass. Um, just because of those, when you... When you focus deeper into the chip, they become much more prominent. And I'm, they, it generally seems to be the back illuminated chips that have the problem. So they're more IR sensitive, um, but they have all the metallization behind the sensor area. And I think that's what you're hitting. You're hitting uh, rear metallization, and then it's possibly bouncing off the front of the cover glass and then back onto the sensor area. But no, I never really got to the bottom of it. And of course, you can find out no information at all from the manufacturers about something that's so... Um, um, no, of course not. A thousand nanometers and, you know, that massive, um, massively bright and not worrying about the bright thing, but worrying about the dim thing next to it. <laughs> you, you never get any information. You just have to try it and see what works. Well, I hadn't seen those uh, pictures uh, in the morning apparitions I was working on Niles before. They've really pushed it to a new level. Yes, I think yeah, they're, absolutely. They're order of magnitude better. Yes. And even if we don't discover any volcanism, just being able to track those clouds, yes. even in low level clouds, yeah. that's something new. Yes, absolutely. It opens up a new field of research. Yeah. And I am, I must say, I'm hugely grateful to Anthony Wesley who, um, you know, gave me a lot of his very valuable time to give me advice and gives other planetary imagers advice on, on things like this and is prepared to talk about anything and give advice freely. And, you know, I wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have done, I wouldn't have done, wouldn't have tried it and wouldn't have done any of it without, without him, really. So, uh, right, really big um, amount of appreciation to Anthony for that. So you've take, had to take him take such a lot of care over this and uh, take into account certain facts that it really it, it contributes to persistence <laughs> and attention to detail. And that, that's what counts in, uh, in so many areas of the observation that we do. Yeah. Persistence and attention yes. to detail. I am persistent. <laughs> so, we're all born with that. Uh, another Thank you. round of applause. Yeah. <laughs>
but you can get fibre to the home in some places, so you can get up to 900 megabits a second at, uh, on the Orkney Islands in a few places. Anyway, um, sky notes for uh, for the coming uh, coming few months, so a bit of a roundup of things that have passed and and things to come. Um, so I was going to start off with uh, Aurora. Um, been some fantastic Aurora displays over the past few months um, since the last Sky Notes, so I thought I'd just show some some nice pictures of those. Um, starting off uh, early February, this is uh, a shot by uh, Dennis Pazinski in, uh, yeah. from Tarbert Ness in, in Scotland. Um, I can't remember which date that was exactly, early February, February 4th or something like that. Yep. And uh, I, as you if anyone's involved with the radio astronomy section, they probably know about my magnetometer, which I've been working on for the past year or two. And uh, I've got some nice traces of magnetic activity now uh, to accompany these. So this was the uh, magnetic activity on that date. And we had some nice uh, nice activity there um, round about the uh, the time of the display. That's not the laser. Never mind. Anyway, um, so um, that was early February, um, uh, and uh, here's another uh, nice picture from. Uh, where am I? Put my glasses on. That was, that's the solution. Um, from Alan Tuch in uh, Murray, uh, and uh, this is a little bit later on. That this is uh, later in February. And uh, another very fine display of the of the aurora, nice uh, uh, green lower glow and the uh, bright red rays, uh, and and this was gave me quite substantial activity on my little magnetogram plot through the uh, the evening. Um, ignore the fluff in the middle of the day; that was me mowing the grass or something uh, near the magnetometer, which is very sensitive to to, to doors opening and things. Uh, and uh, this is Ronan Newman's uh, uh, shot of the same display on uh, from from Northern Ireland. Um, uh, another nice uh, nice image of it. Uh, then in early March, um, this is from Dennis again uh, from Tarbert Ness, north of Inverness. Uh, another really nice display of uh, of the lights. And uh, again, my magnetogram picked that up quite nicely in the afternoon and the evening. Uh, lots of activity going on. Uh, and then uh, Steve Knight's been away in Norway. I think Steve's here somewhere. I think I saw him earlier on. Oh, he's just here behind us. Um, and some, uh, I'm not sure how many nights he had clear in Norway, not, perhaps not as, as many as uh, he did have liked to have had, uh, but had some really splendid photographs and videos. So I've, I've stolen a couple of his videos to, to show tonight. I hope he doesn't mind too much. Um, awesome. Uh, which he's also posted on the B or links to those are on the uh, on the B website in his members album area, uh, and uh, I think uh, Steve was away for maybe a couple of weeks in uh, in, in Norway, and uh, let's hope this plays properly. So Steve was uh, taking these uh, pictures, these movies, uh, using Sony A7S camera. Uh, so not sorry, Panasonic A7S camera, and uh, these are live videos. So this is this is as as real time. Um, so I really like these because these give a real um, impression of what the uh, what the, the the real time aurora looks like in the in the uh, in the sky. And you see these curtaining effects, and uh, you can see from the camera movements. You know this is this is real time, not. Uh, uh, not uh, not um, time lapse, uh, and it's really bright. Uh, but of course, this is north of Norway, so it's uh, it's not altogether surprising. I think that's the end of that clip. And then there's uh, another clip. Again, this just shows the. Uh, the, the remarkable, both the speed and, and, and in a sense, the slowness as well, because you don't really, until you really see them for real, um, you know, they have this certain majestic slow 
movement appeal as well. So it sort of reminds me of playing with cathode ray tubes and magnets and stuff when you were young. I'm sure that'd be far too dangerous an experiment to do in school these days. <laughs> yeah. So if you go up to Iceland or North of Norway, then these are some of the rural views you might get if you're uh, a, a, a lucky enough to get the timing right for an aurora to be on, on show and uh, and B, get some clear skies as well. So this was uh, the beginning of, of March. And then uh, probably just about a week later on, um, we had another um, display come up. Uh, and uh, there's a couple of pictures here from, oh, there's a picture from, by Nick James from uh, he was up at Dennis's uh, observatory in Tarbert Ness in North of Inverness again. Um, and uh, uh, this is my magnetogram of the event, which unhappily went over midnight. So this is my, my two day plot, um, which I joined just graphically. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a substantial uh, um, trans transient over the, uh, over the midnight hour. <coughs> Uh, and uh, but yeah, lots of interesting magnetic activity again. Um, so this is Nick's video. You can just drop the lights a bit. So this is a little bit fainter, um, mostly time lapse um, video, I think. Um, a bit fainter. This is further, further south, of course, than from where where Steve was. Um, still using the uh, A7S camera. Uh, I think, and um, speed it up uh, with the, uh, the slow motion a bit. Again, this is about 25 times the time. It's interesting to get these lower rays below the, the big green upper arc. Um, quite often, when you view aurora from north of Scotland, you'll see the lower arc and then and then the display above it. I guess visually maybe it wasn't quite so obvious, the big green band above. No, I mean, it, 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 visually, I mean, the thing about images is the colours are obviously much mm. uh, striking. But the thing you see visually, and in particular with that one, is, is pulsing, and the pulsing was happening really rapidly. Mm. Um, and I've not seen that. And these, these ones are as short as exposures that I could do, just to try and show some of the structure. You can see some of the pulsing in that exposure. Is that an A7 camera, Nick? Yeah, A7S. It's the only camera to use for aurora photography. I mean, it is a stunningly good camera. And they've got pink of coming up in the tops of the rays, the higher, higher altitudes stuff. I think that's the end. So those videos are linked from Nick's members page as well on the, on the website. So if you want to go have a look at them again, then you can just head off that direction and, uh, and take a look. Um, a few excellent photographs as well. So uh, um, this was uh, Gordon Mackey's uh, uh, image from Thurzo, Thurzo Beach. Um, again, you can see some of the similar sort of structures as well in the next video. Um, but yeah, it's a, a tremendous picture across uh, Thurzo Beach. And uh, Alan Tuch again uh, took this uh, nice picture from, uh, from his uh, position in Moray. And um, 
this is actually a picture from uh, just, uh, I, I guess, just above Macclesfield. Uh, a friend of mine, Trevor Perry, um, lives up there and uh, uh, went out to, to see if he could photograph the aurora. So that's the aurora over Manchester, um, the bright yellow glow to the north there. Um, so, yeah, if you uh, get into the dark skies of the Peak District, you might be able to catch the aurora there as well if it's bright enough. Um, the um, uh, when the next aurora comes along, um, we won't really know. Um, there was a space weather alert uh, out about this morning, I think, actually, of a of another G3 class event heading our way. Um, so possibly in another day or two, uh, we might uh, get more northern aurora. And round about the times of the equinoxes, there's also an increased uh, sort of higher activity um, possibility. Um, because of the uh, orientation of the Earth's magnetic field and the Sun's magnetic field can cause um, coupling. Uh, so you get enhanced coupling at the time of the equinoxes. Um, so maybe, uh, although we pass the equinox, we'll still maybe get some good displays over the next next few weeks. So uh, moving on to the Sun. Um, I went out and had a look at the Sun a couple of weeks ago with my, my solar scope for the first time for quite a while. And, and it, was, it was decidedly dull, um, un, 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 unfortunately. Um, but uh, I went out last weekend, and uh, it's, it's a nice little sunspot group and a few prominences around. Uh, and uh, this was uh, a display, uh, an image, and this is pretty much the same image as what I saw with my, my solar scope. Uh, from, uh, but this is from South Australia, uh, Gerard Cowdy. Um, took a splendid uh, image, this is a white light image of the uh, the main sunspot group uh, so that was really quite interesting to see and he also did an equivalent in uh, uh, in calcium K and uh, uh, shows the uh, this interesting third group actually which looked um, pretty uh, uh, indistinct in in the uh, in the in the white light and uh, I, I didn't really notice it in my h alpha scope um, but um, it's quite nice, interesting structure there. Um, so yeah, always worth having, going out, having a look at the sun if you're a casual observer or if you're a regular solar observer, getting out and checking things out. Um, Mars. This is a just a picture from a couple, from from a, a year or two ago, um, just to, to illustrate the planet. Um, Richard tells me, uh, Richard McKim tells me that there's uh, it's a bit too small to do anything very serious with. So. Uh, uh, just to kindly skip over it, really. So I'm just going to do that. Um, this uh, shot shows the uh, the lineup of the the planets coming up. This little Mars is pretty low in the sky. Um, Saturn's uh, at the high highest, and then we've got uh, Jupiter and uh, and Venus to the left there. This is an early uh, January images of of Jupiter from Southern observers, uh, and again. Our, for the uh, for northern hemisphere observers, uh, Jupiter is still not very well placed. Uh, so um, unfortunately, there will be things to look out for as it gets higher in the sky over the next few months. Um, but probably that will be after the next uh, next sky notes, really. Um, John Rogers has been working on uh, the Juno cam images, and this is a, a, a recent whole um, planet uh, mosaic of Juno cam images. Um, showing some interesting features and things which he will be wanting to look out for when the uh, it comes back into view. Um, and uh, these are all present up, up on the, the BA website as well. So you can go on there and uh, look into the Jupiter section and, and find these, uh, these images and much more commentary from John uh, about them. And John's also put together this uh, interesting a uh, pair of images which is, shows the uh, the, um, the shadow of Ganymede uh, across the surface. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Saturn and the outer planets, again, not awfully well uh, placed, really. Um, Saturn is probably the best placed of the, of the current bunch of planets, but... Um, um, it's still pretty low and uh, pretty hard to observe. This is uh, um, uh, Trevor Barry's south in South uh, Australia um, 
image, uh, rec a recent image from him. Um, so showing nice for southern observers, but uh, unfortunately for those of us in the north, it's, uh, it's not so good. Um, this is the early pre-dawn sky um, showing Saturn and uh, again Mars and, and Jupiter and Venus. So we can make quite a nice little um, um, a nice little lineup of the planets to view or, or take pictures of, but uh, practically doing much in the way of serious observing is a bit tricky, really. Uh, Mark, uh, Mike Fuchs uh, did uh, suggest uh, showing this uh, image of Uranus. This is uh, taken by Martin um, and, uh, uh, and shows... Um, I'm not sure where Martin's completely convinced, but, but Mike and, uh, and David Arditi were reasonably convinced this shows the ring of Saturn, uh, the ring of U one of Uranus's rings. Um, this is an animated GIF shows a, a, a predicted position for it and the, the, the actual image. So, um, so that's 144 minutes of accumulated exposure. <laughs> Do that. See how noisy it is. That's 144. Yeah. Effectively. Lots of short exposures again, yeah. 144 minutes of exposure to reduce the shock noise. And you've got the, that's the, the, you're the brightest ring of Uranus is the Epsilon ring. But I've isolated that in the, the SETI's Uranus viewer and aligned it on positions on Aranda and uh, Ariel. Yeah. And then my image behind it, which, you know, there does seem to be something there lines up quite well with where the epsilon ring is supposed to supposed to lie. So this is something I've been working on for every every autumn for the last five years. <laughs> and this was the longest <laughs> two and a half hour session. It's, uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's uh, yeah, a remarkable uh, uh, observation though and, and, and just shows what great work um, amateurs can do. Um, and on the subject of comets, I asked Nick what good comets were coming up, and he said there weren't any. So um, <laughs> I've got a couple of pictures, really. Um, both ninth magnitude comets are, are the, the two brightest at the current set. Um, I, I picked this picture by Martin Mobley because it's got a little nice open cluster of stars in the same picture with uh, Omicron Persei in the uh, in the same frame. This is 19P Borelli, which was last month's uh, Comet of the Month uh, um, from the Comet section. Uh, and the, uh, the second one is uh, um, 2009 L3 Atlas. Um, and um, this is an image by Nick Quinn uh, of this um, comet. Um, it was interesting that Robin Ledbetter had uh, taken an <coughs> evening of imaging of spectra of comets um, to uh, um, show that we can do spectra of these as well. Um, and uh, again, if you want to see this, probably need, really need to look at this in a bit more detail uh, on the website, uh, on the BU website and, and Robin's uh, members page. Um, you can download and have a look at this graph in a bit more detail. Of the, the various spectra of these comets. <coughs> Moving on to variable stars. Um, so a few variable stars of interest. Um, Chi Cygni is um, coming up to its maximum, as circled here on the uh, on the, um, the neck of Cygnus, and um, currently about. Uh, well, third magnitude through magnitude 3.3 or so is its brightest. It's currently approaching its brightest and will be fading over the next few months. It's a long period variable, so uh, um, it's quite um, easy to follow over, over many months. Um, and because it's quite bright to start with, um, it's an ideal sort of project for anyone that's wanting to get into um, variable star observing. So you can start view doing it, viewing it visually or, or with binoculars. Uh, and when it gets too faint for binoculars, for visual, uh, just just straight visual observing, you can go to binoculars, and then small telescopes will, will take it into its its, min, its minimum. So uh, that's a good candidate for the the next few months. 
and, and that's the, the light curve. So it's not the most exciting of light curves, but. That's your <laughs> 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 it's the deep sky observer. Um, SS Cygni is a um, is a dwarf nova, um, and uh, is located um, in that spot just there, uh, and uh, has a has a more interesting light curve. Uh, so um, um, again, it's uh, a good candidate for observing over the over the next few months. Uh, and then uh, Markarian four two one is. Uh, a deep sky object, an active galactic nuclei, um, BL LAC object, sometimes known as a blazar, um, and it's an Ursa major, so it's uh, it's relatively available most of the time, and it's recently brightened, so it's quite an interesting thing to to pop out and have a look at, uh, and maybe monitor over a few a few <coughs> months to see what it what it does. Um, it's quite close to a star fifty one or some. Ursa Majoris, um, so it's quite easy to find um, and image. So if you get some images of 51 Ursa, Maj Ursa Majoris, uh, then uh, and keep taking those over a few weeks, and you might be able to build up your own own light curve of the uh, of the blazar. And uh, this is its recent uh, light curve, so um, it does go up and down a bit. Um, so as far as I can expect to. Go as far as variables are concerned, really. Um, so, uh, just to finish off, a few uh, a few deep sky notes. And um, yeah, I thought I'd just uh, have a quick remembrance for to Ron Arbor. Um, Ron Arbor was uh, the founder of the the deep sky section back in 1981. Um, obviously, uh, a, a very uh, important member of the association uh, in those days, uh, and uh, sadly missed. Um, the last supernova discovery I have that I found for him um, was in 20, um, 2019, um, and that was his 46th. Um, so I've taken these from reports by Guy Hurst in uh, in the journal, um, and I think there are possibly others that might be added to that list. Um, so some, some people have suggested it was about 49. Um, there were some which were perhaps co-discoveries um, or um, ones which he discovered, but they then turned out to be have been pre-discovered by somebody else. So uh, maybe that number is a little bit um, uncertain. Um, but it's in that region, and it's the, uh, the second largest number of of supernovas that have been found, uh, or the, he is the, the, the second largest uh, record for supernova discoveries in the UK. Um, but sadly, nobody else has uh, really taken up the mantle of doing supernova patrolling. I guess it's a bit too, maybe not too difficult, but it's uh, uh, the automated mechanisms, the automated patrols have, have taken all that over, really. Um, so it's really quite hard to, to, to make in independent discoveries by amateurs these days. So um, Ron did specialise really in, uh, in, in uh, supernovas which were very close to the centre of the, of the galaxy. So this is uh, an example of one of his 2016 um, supernova discoveries. Uh, and uh, the star there, the supernova, star and supernova is very close to the centre of that galaxy. And I think in this next one again, very close, and, and some of these can be quite hard for the uh, the patrol um, software to, to detect. Just a quick round up on, on variable nebula. We had a talk on that last time round. Um, this is uh, McNeil's nebula um, in uh, near M78, um, image by Richard Sargent, um, and it's still not there. So. Um, um, it should be between near to these two stars, which are in the centre of the screen. Um, but uh, we'll uh, we have to really wait until autumn comes round again to have another good look at this. Heinz Variable Nebula. We heard about um, Heinz earlier on. Was one of the uh, uh, Comet Medal Award winners. So this was the same Heinz as as discovered this 
this, this variable nebula. Um, and uh, it's been showing lots of interesting activity and uh, certainly well worth keeping an eye on. Uh, and just for completeness, Hubble's variable nebula. Uh, image here by Martin Cook. So I thought I'd just finish off with some deep sky highlights. Um, as um, was mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, or perhaps earlier at the council meeting, there's been a rise in the use of the, the EV scopes, the unistellar scopes and, uh, and other EA techniques. And uh, this is uh, M1 uh, taken by Alan Thomas. Uh, and uh, Alan's been doing a lot of work with his unistellar scope. Uh, this is only a four inch aperture refract reflector. Um, but uh, with the long exposures on these uh, equipment, you can get really quite nice images of deep sky objects. So this is the Crab Nebula, of course, uh, and uh, another member, uh, Mark Fairfax, just recently joined the association. So welcome to Mark if he's uh, if he's viewing uh, remotely today. Um, nice galaxy and a couple of very faint galaxies nearby. Um, so uh, can really pull up quite. Uh, quite um, remote detail on uh, on these images with these, uh, just a four inch scope. It's quite, quite remarkable really. And they, they track well as well. Um, this is kind of on the uh, the other side of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, of the, the scale of things. Uh, this is with a 20 inch uh, Obsession Dobsonian um, driven by a servo capped system, uh, but using EA techniques to, to capture the images. So these are five image um, stacks of two second exposures um, to make up a 20 minute exposure of um, M65. Um, so this is quite remarkable. I think somebody asked at the deep sky section meeting whether you could um, drive and get good images from a driven Jobsonian. Um, so um, yeah, clearly it is possible. Uh, this is a recent uh, picture of the Owl Nebula, M97, by uh, uh, Peter Goodhue. Um, I just noticed today that it's been promoted to be the ast amateur astronomer photographer of the photo of the day two award. Um, I don't really know what, the, what that award is or what that page is, but uh, um, it's certainly it's the second of them. Second of them. So, um, but yeah, it's remarkable detail in this, this image. Um, Peter uses a remote scope in Spain um, for his, uh, his imaging. Um, and it shows this outer halo, which I think is not very commonly imaged uh, or seen in, in uh, certainly in amateur images. Uh, and finally, just a, a nice image of the Rosette Nebula by uh, Neil Webster.